discussion way online. Also, you can use it in an online course. So VoiceThread is fun because students get to record their own voices, and they get very excited about that, and they get to talk live with other students, especially if they're a distance student. It's one way to, to connect. They get to have a profile picture, and you can post content, and then the students' pictures appear around the content, and they can go in and talk with each other, post new voice threads. They can point to things. They can draw on the screen to circle and highlight things in whatever it is they're looking at. So let's play a short video here. Um, at the bottom, just hit play, and that should go. And hopefully our volume is not. Nobody should know. There we go. A voice thread can securely capture and hold an entire group discussion on one simple page. When people make their new comments, they will fill in around the edges, and the participants can even draw while they're talking, which is a very efficient way of getting your point across. Down here, behind the comment button, are actually five different ways for people to comment. By telephone, by webcam, by microphone, by text, or even file upload. Which means that if you can load this page at all, you can participate in this conversation, period. Now let's take a quick look at how you get around in a voice thread. The first thing is the image itself. If you want to get a better look at it, you can click on the image to zoom in and look around. You can try this right now while I'm talking. Just click once to go in and once to get out. And while you're zoomed in, you can move your mouse around and pull the picture in any direction you want. The next thing, which is really the most important, is how to comment. The first thing you need to know is that you are always in control and you can always delete your own comment. Just click this garbage can icon and you'll see whenever your comment is playing and then you can try it again. So don't sweat it and just say whatever's on your mind. After you've looked around at this voice thread and you register, click the comment button that's right down here, and you can try out all five different ways to comment. The last thing is how to get around in a voice thread. There are two ways to hear comments. The first is to just click on a person's face like mine over there, or you can use the controls that are beneath the type of record buttons over here. To go through all of the other pages of the voice book, you can either use the big arrows that are in each corner, or you can click on the navigator button over here. And if you click on that, it will show you all of the pages at once, and you can then click on the one you want to go to. The rest of this book is going to show you some individual pages from some voice threads we really like and also show you a couple of hidden tricks that a voice thread can perform. So we'll just stop the video right there. But as you can see, and Cody, if you'll go actually back to voice thread for a second and then click on the X button in the top right hand corner, then um, click on all in the top left there, you'll see I've created a where do you, do a, do you live in Wyoming. Um, so this is just an example. Hey, welcome to ITF 4340 for the summer. I'm happy to have you in class. For your first voice thread assignment, I would like you to tell me about a place in which you have visited in Wyoming. Feel free to draw on the map and record your voice thread here. I'll look forward to hearing your responses. Thank you. So students can go in, they can draw on the map, they can tell us a little about their hometown and get to know each other, and we start to hear each other's voices from the get-go. So this is really fun, especially for me as a student in an online class. One of the most exciting things last spring was a course I took on instructional technology was actually getting to record our own pod and vodcasts and share them with other students. It was fun to put the voices with the students' names and the careers that we knew they held. And then actually when I was out around the state recruiting for the statewide program for which I work, I met some of my classmates. They happened to be at a couple of our outreach graduation ceremonies. And they said, oh, you're Athena Kennedy. I recognize your pictures and I recognize your voice. So that was really fun for me because you never meet your, your online classmates. So VoiceThread has lots of potential. Feel free to go in there, voicethread.com, bookmark it, and at, during the work session, Cody and I can help you set up an account if you're interested. Absolutely. So I told you we talked about Facebook. Now, a lot of you probably have Facebook accounts, but let's start with your students. How many of you, or what percentage of your students do you guys think have Facebook? What's the reason matter of 100% of your people? Yeah. 99% of millennials 
have a social networking account, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, and the majority of them have multiple accounts, so a lot of them. Now, we have, as people, personal profiles, and we're able to friend people. And when we friend someone, it's a two-way connection. I can see their stuff, they can see my stuff. What we're talking about here today is Facebook pages. And a Facebook page is a one-way connection. And it's not a, it doesn't start with a profile. So if you create a Facebook page, your students don't see you on Facebook, they see your Facebook page. And when you put that page out there, they like the page. There's no personal connection with you. They can't see any of your information, and you can't see any of their information. They get information pushed from your Facebook page, and they can view your Facebook page, but there's no blending or crossing of personal information. But so thinking about 100% or a large majority of our students have Facebook. And I, I mentioned earlier that when I talk to faculty, they say, or they kind of cringe, you know, Facebook official students go, they don't come back. How much time do you guys think students spend on Facebook on average every day? A couple hours. Two or three hours? Two or three hours? <laughs> 24 hours. <laughs> they may have it on 24 hours. Yep, yep. Okay. Yeah. Right, well, we have our, our mobile devices. Do you guys know about that? But when someone comments on my wall or comments on a comment that I've posted or comments on a comment that I've commented on, I get a, <laughs> I get a notification pushed to my phone, which I have with me all the time. So it's like I'm on Facebook or can be on. Right there. Twitter going on. It's like I'm on there all the time. So we have a few estimations, two hours, four hours. How many times a day do you think students check Facebook? 20, 30? We have some high estimates. Does anybody think it's less than that? Just out of curiosity. I think it depends, I think it depends on the person because I think some people are more comfortable with it than others and more connected to it. Sure. Absolutely. Think about, in the way that we've answered that question, how many times the students check Facebook, 20 or 30 times, and compare that in your head to how often students are checking their university email. <laughs> yeah. how, how often is that? How many times a day or a week do you think they check? As infrequently as possible. As infrequently as possible. Right. We want to compare that. I don't have anything that draws me there. If I'm on Facebook as a student, all my friends are there. It's the cool place to hang out. I want to go see them. So. Absolutely, go ahead. I just find this terribly sad. No, I don't. I know, but I want to get a life. Yeah, I want to say the students get a life. I mean, yeah, people are homeless. I don't know that. But in, in, and I know this is where the kids are, and I know this is where they hang out, and I know this is where they like to check on each other and their relationships status and all that stuff. But I just think it's so sad. When the two of you said you had your phone on all the time, I think it's rude. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's interesting. And I'm glad you shared that opinion because that seriously is the um, the interest of a lot of people is that perhaps it's because not everybody grew up with cell phone in hand. But the millennial students of today did. And, and that is their life. Their life is connected through Facebook and through their phone, as well as just as you and I might stop on the street and talk, and we still do those things as well, too. But basically, this is who they are. So in a sense, um, we're embracing the thing that they're very using and connected to that they feel comfortable with. Well, yeah, and I, I said that. I do understand that that's where they are, and I do understand and, and get the whole millennial children. I've got two of my own. but. I just, I just think some, I don't know, some manners need to be taught or something. Or in paradise. Well, I think that we, we were talking about this in a way where we're saying students are on Facebook at the exclusion of interacting in real life with people, and that's absolutely not so. We use Facebook. I'm thinking about a theme that I have. This group on Facebook is called Larry Trent, and it's a group of our colleagues. Ted is here. Um, Chris is on this group, and we yes, like, it? we yeah. organize social events with Facebook because we know we're on Facebook often, we know that it pushes to our phones, and so we create a group in which we post, hey, we're doing happy hour at 5.30, or there's boot camp this week, if you guys are interested, uh, stop by, or just a right. number of stuff. Well, and, and we're using it not in place of other communication, we're using it to enhance, so I feel more connected than I ever did in my history based on the fact that I now have this push notification at Facebook. So um, I feel almost nine times more connected than before when I had to either stop and phone call someone or I had to wait for a response on email. 
now it's, it's, it has sped up our world, but in, in, it depends on how you use it. But in my perspective, it's in a good way. Absolutely. As students, how do you think, one of the issues I have as instructors of Facebook is that if I'm in a face-to-face -face class and we're doing something and, and, and they need their laptops for whatever reason, they're taking notes, whatever, I've got PowerPoints, whatever it is, and they're on face, Facebook, I take, I take umbrage of that. To me, that's very rude. Is that how you see it? So here's how I see it, and I'm an instructor in an LCCC classroom, and students are allowed to have, I say, take your mobile devices out, put them on the table. A, I can see them, right? B, get your laptops open, and I'm a wanderer. I wander the room. C, go to Facebook and check the link I just posted before class. So I engage them with Facebook, or I say, today's not a Facebook day, but open Twitter. We're going to do Twitter today. So instead of essentially um, taking the rights of using Facebook or Twitter away, employing and engaging them with using it and giving dates for those things. Now, am I going to lose students occasionally? Oh, yes. But how often, just sitting in here, even if you're not on Facebook, does your mind wander? Your mind wanders whether you're on Facebook or not. So I'm losing you in a classroom, even if you're sitting straight up, eyes face forward, hands on the desk, pencil in hand, I still lose you. Whether it's Facebook or your mind wandering or you know thinking about what's for dinner, I'm hungry. Communication states that we, we only are listening really to what 30% of what you're saying anyway. So I, yeah, I'm going to lose you some, but I figure it's not more than I'm going to lose you anyway. And if I'm engaging enough as an instructor and I'm employing you in group activities and using your devices, I'm going to get more of you than if I try to ignore those or shut them down. If a student walks in the room, I say, put your cell phone away, close your laptop, shut your bag, keep quiet, everybody listen. Now that's ex exaggeratory, but let's say I do that. I just said, I've shut you off, I don't like what you do, I don't like your device, I don't like your technology, I don't like who you are right now, okay, as a person. So where if I say, come in, take it out, put it on the table, let me see what you got. Oh, I love your new skin it. That's a skin for your laptop. Oh, what a nice cell phone cover. Oh, she likes me. She connected to my cell phone. But then I dive into content, and they, they connect that way. So students, so I think there's a way to channel it, is all I'm saying. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. The other thing that I want to point out, is we, these, these are college students. These are young adults. If we don't trust them at this point in their lives to make decisions about their own time management, and we are there looking over their shoulder, oh, are you on Facebook today? What are you looking at? Is that actually important? <laughs> How are we going to trust these people to, to go out and work in the real world and have real jobs? Right? If we don't give them the, the, the freedom to act as adults, we're going to know they're ready to do that. And truthfully, at work, um, with Cody, Christy, Larry, Jeff, and I, we're all on Facebook, and sometimes we're two offices away and communicating about something going on at work in one of our groups on Facebook. So it becomes more not just a social network, it's a working network for us, too, where we're connecting with colleagues. And so this is the world in which the students live and the world in which they're going to go out and be employed. So empowering them to live in that world, I think, is a good thing. Go ahead. I have a conversation with a friend who works in the state government the other day, and there is no access for those people at their jobs through Facebook and so forth. So is there ever a time to say to students, let's go today without that communication tool because we might be facing that, those kinds of challenges at work. Right? Oh, I agree. And there are days where I say, everybody's cell phones out today. We may or may not use them. And then they don't know. Then they're in suspense, right? The other thing is, personally, on the weekends, I'm not glued to my cell phone. It can stay in the house while I'm out gardening, I'm hiking, I'm a runner. So uh, even though I am of that generation, I'm not constantly glued to it. Um, I take time away from it. So I do agree that there are times. There's plenty of times where I say, OK, no computer today. Let's put posters up on the wall. Or let's go to a voice thread, and we're going to talk there today. So there's ways to take them away from those other technologies, too. Would you agree, Cody? Yeah, absolutely. I think and personally, there are days when I get home and I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm full up. I can't take any more. Any, you know, push notifications, they were messaging, or emails. I just put my cell phone, plug it to the wall, and turn on the phone. I'm not, not going to deal with that. But, but I know I can't do that like Monday at 1 p.m. when I get back to the office and there are people wanting me. It's like there's an appropriate time for that. And in the classroom, when they're engaged in a project, that's the appropriate time. And I think we can use or give them freedom to decide, discover that for themselves, so they can take that skill onto the real world. 
And I think modeling behavior is good too. So the instructor's walking around in the front. I don't do this in the classroom. I have my cell phone, but I'm not walking around with it all the time necessarily. So modeling the professionalism. So interesting, and we love this conversation. Thank you very much. Keep bringing those suggestions, questions, and ideas because this is exactly what we hoped for. But in lieu of time, let's move on to our next uh, slide. So I asked you how much time you thought students might be. This is what the research says. On average, an hour and 41 minutes a day. That's seven days a week, an hour and 40 minutes. That's huge. Think about how much time your students spend doing homework each night. They'd be all love if our students spend an hour and 41 minutes doing homework every night. On average, 5.75 times a day. That's like more often than they eat. Like they're on Facebook all the time. These statistics make Facebook the most visited website on the internet. That means if your students are on the internet, chances are they're on Facebook. What we're going to show you is how you can bring your content, your academic content, and engage students where they already are on Facebook. So bringing, reaching students in their worlds. We have two examples from teachers here at the University of Wyoming that are using Facebook to engage with students. First is from online classes is uh, Steve Galstock, who's an education professor. He teaches social literacy. You can see on April 2nd, he's posting supplemental content to his course. So he's cultural capital from Lily Allen in a YouTube video. And you see that 16 students, 16 of his students, have commented on this video. In fact, Kristen here found her own video, The History of Communication, What's Next? It's a step-by-step -step evolution of communication mediums throughout history. It's a really great video. And she thought it was of value to share with the class. So she posted on the Facebook page, you can see a student responded. And that may have been Steve, I'm not sure if you can understand that. But by looking at this page, you don't see Steve Gallifax's name. He's, he's not here. He's, it's almost as if this is not really his personal page, which is how it should operate. So we asked the students to like the page. You can see I've liked it up on the top right, it says liked. But I have no personal connection on Facebook with Steve. The second example here is Holes 1000. This is a giant course. There are two or three students. Uh, this particular section is taught by um, Kennedy Pen O'Toole. And you can see she's posting here, I finally updated the test to grades. So it's her sitting in and asked about her students, check grades, I updated it. Oh, do you have a question over here? I just have a question that's probably a student. Oh, there are stupid questions. Yeah. Did you read that, the comment from the semester? Absolutely. Yep. You can delete everything that starts with the new if you'd like to. Yeah, and as things are posted, you can choose to delete them if they're something that you don't want to see. So if they make comments on the session and then we're done with that, Sure. Right. And you see, these show up in order they're posted. So November 12th, there's that, that post. November 3rd here, she posted, woo, the class average in the scan terms was a full five points higher than the first test. So this is relevant academic content for her students. So when they walk on Facebook, we, and we know that there's six times a day, and, oh, my test is free. Hey, let me go look at that. So rather than send her an email and say, hey, is the test free? Or checking a million times, they know. It's going to be posted on Facebook, it's ready, everyone's ready, they'll, they'll be notified of that. But she's also using this to post content that isn't perfectly fitting right into her lecture. So this uh, this is a picture of a state legislator hanging on of the banister, covering up the clock. <laughs> because once it strikes midnight, they can no longer work. They're done. And uh, the caption there is trying to fit everything in the legislative session. So that they not fit in an academic lecture. You're not going to see the picture in the textbook, but it's relevant to what she's teaching her students. And this is another way to share that with you. And it's engaging for students, makes them laugh. Now, did you have a comment? Yeah, how do you make one of these? <coughs> we can show you in our work session if Absolutely. you're interested. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah, we're happy to show you. So, as a student, I go and I like these pages, and it's this, this information is pushed to me, meaning I don't have to go and look at the polls 1,000 page to get information. I just go to Facebook, log on, and as Facebook has trained me and 300 other million Americans to do, is to wait. Uh, to tell things show up in my newsfeed. This is my newsfeed. This is actually from yesterday. So you can see I have my friend here is posting some funny pictures. But I liked Ann Alexander's um, congressional or, or campaign page. And see, there's her update showing right in my newsfeed. So I didn't put it Ann's page. She posted an update and it was posted or pulled right into my newsfeed. So for your students, you'll post an update and it will show up in their newsfeed. Now, if I want to interact with that, I have the option of liking, commenting, or sharing that right there. And then I can click on the Ann Alexander Family County and click on that to go to her page. And students are receiving this on their mobile device. You need to get a hold of students and tell them class is canceled. Or this week I've had an emergency, I will not be in the discussion. What's the fastest way to get a hold of them? They're going to get a push notification on their phone. 
Right, so if you post an update, class is canceled, and then the students, okay, where is class next week? And, and then you write back, oh, it's in a, in a regular classroom, or we're moving it to the annex. Because the students commented on that, when we go back, they'll get a push notification directly to you. Question? Yeah, I have a question. Is it um, kind of replacing the EPA or the uh, college like the, the platform for the online mm -hmm. course? Not replacing. So Steve Bialystok still uses, has an e-college um, shell and still hosts discussions there. This is a supplement right now, and we're not encouraging everybody to go out may replace their courses with Facebook. That's not the case. In fact, we still believe you should have that course shell and you should interactively use it. This is a supplement. This is a way to reach students outside of the course shell and add to the class. So, so like the thread discussion I heard on the back of the voice was, so is, uh, in addition to the online you use this and uh, I know you're speaking with younger, but uh, don't you think <coughs>
to do some of these supplemental things, and students, again, are very engaged by it. That's my opinion. If there are other things to share out there, we can do that. But I'm noticing our wait, wait, presentation is going pretty long. Here, so we've hijacked this presentation, so they've been running over. What we're going to do is we're going to let, it, let them finish. We've run into our play time, but we're just going to let them finish their presentation. We're all engaged with it. I just want them to not feel rushed. So I'm just going to let them finish the presentation at this okay. point. Okay, and, and we'll work it out another way. So I just want to okay. go ahead and go. Thanks, Christy. We were hoping because this is great discussion, and I don't want to cut this off. So. Any other comments on workload or time spent in these supplemental? Go ahead, Ed. Well, I'm just realizing that uh, more and more of these things are just going to help me be more efficient in what I'm already doing. You know, I often get students that send me articles that I'd like to share with the class, and I oftentimes find things and say, wow, this is just what we're talking about, you know. And so we have that exchange, but this would be a lot more efficient, you know, and optional. Great. Thank you for that piece of information. I think Cody would agree. For us, it is more efficient. It's efficient for the student to receive it. But once you get it all set up, it's efficient for the instructor because instead of getting three or four emails from students, hey, are the grades posted? Are the grades posted? Or when will the grades be posted? One message out to all students, no email. So you saved yourself that time in responding to those emails. Another thing we're seeing is students actually post a question on the Facebook page. And before the instructor logs on and respond, another student might respond. So actually, that that resource we're looking for is under uh, document sharing under the course channel. Look there, it's titled Guess. So it's more efficient for you, and in fact, sometimes the students are answering other students' questions. So let's move on. Now we're talking about mobile engagement. You know, the thing that I carry on mobile devices, wherever we go. And in fact, that's the majority of college students. It's estimated that 97% of college students send and receive text messages every day. And, and truthfully, if you can engage the student with the device, you're empowering them as a learner. And the reason I believe that to be true, not only from personal experience as an instructor and the student, is because this, again, is the environment in which we live. They have it with them at all times, and they like it. They want to use it. They want to touch it, feel it, talk to people, feel connected. We're social creatures as humans. Our nature in communication is to want to talk to each other. So it's very important, if you can, to reach out to them how they're communicating, and this is how they're doing it. So one fun thing, this is a fun mobile thing that's very easy to use, it's called Goose Chase. And I'm a big scavenger hunt fan, as my colleagues know. Any chance I get, I can we put in a scavenger hunt? I wanted to do one for boot camp, but we didn't want to overwhelm everybody with lots of fun scavenger hunts. So we will have one for evolution, if anybody wants to come to the evolution conference in October. Um, basically, Goose Chase is a fun way to create a scavenger hunt on the fly, very easy. It takes the first time I went in to do it, and I'm not actually the most tech savvy person on earth. Cody, I would say, is extremely tech savvy and can fix things in a heartbeat. Me, it takes me a little bit, but I can get it. Um, this took me 15 minutes to set up a little scavenger hunt for students. So let's watch a quick video on how fun it is and how easy it is to use. Again, go to goosechase.com. I'm very good organized. You don't want to run like that chicken with his head cut off. So what do you do? Goose Chase will let you keep your head. Goose Chase is a cool app that lets you effortlessly put together a memorable scavenger hunt. All you have to do is, one, sign in, two, create missions or choose missions from an extensive list, and three, announce the event to your participants. Now you can sit back and enjoy. Participants download the Goose Chase app and join the game you created. They complete missions and gain points by submitting a picture of themselves or their team members during each challenge. Submitted photos are judged by other participants, so photos can lose points if they're not good enough. When the time is up, the team with the most points wins. Participants run around, meet new people, complete challenges, collect points, and have a blast. So keep your head where it belongs and start your first scavenger hunt today with Goose Chase. Scavenger hunt for the masses. Now this is a fun one because students could do it in a, in a virtual classroom or in a face-to-face -face classroom. I downloaded Goose Chase on my phone and when you open it, it actually looks um, like this. If you can't see it from afar, I can pass it around if you want. And I have two Goose Chases in there. I have a Tech Trot and a Home Stretch is my recommended game. I made the Tech Trot and I put a little horse in there because he's trotting around. And then basically I would tell students, download the Goose Chase app. It's free. 
Guess what? It's free. And if you don't have a smartphone, you still use a flip phone or anything like that, that's perfectly fine. Find a partner. This is a partner game. Find a partner who has a uh, mobile device that you can use. You can work in groups. And then they just pre press on Tech Trot, and it gives them four scavenger hunt items. So I made it small at first. They have to poll in to polleverywhere.com. And if you sign up for Goose Chase, you can type in Tech Trot, and my Tech Trot will come up for you. So if you really want to do a scavenger hunt, you can. You poll in on polleverywhere.com, which most all of you have already done that since we've been here. You have to tweet something. So you have to create a Twitter account and tweet um, something based on a hashtag. There's also MindMeister, which is a fun one that we're not talking about today, but mindmeister.com. Concept mapping. You have to create an account there and then create a concept map of the content we just discussed in class. Just short, brief, simple little tasks, but it gets them engaged. And then lastly, they get to voice it. They get to add a voice thread to one of the discussions that I created. Once they've completed all that, I can see that they've completed it. But when they do it, they get to check it off in Goose Chase, and it goes to my Goose Chase tech trot to tell me who has completed the tasks. So then you can award credit, or it can just be for fun. Questions? Comments? Yeah. MindMeister.com. It's a, a concept mapping site, really cool. We can check that out in some work time this afternoon too if people are interested. MindMeister.com. Tammy. Do you ever have students who do not have the technology to be able to participate and how do you handle those situations? Yes, and what I do is I have them work in partners or groups. So I had a student who was 81 years old in my um, public speaking class and we did a goose chase. And he has never owned a cell phone and never planned to own a cell phone, didn't know how to use one, and really didn't use a laptop. He would hand his assignments in via paper. So you probably, you might know who I'm talking about. A very nice guy, learned a lot. So what he did, he came to me after we did a few things in class, and I invited him to partner up. And the students in class, I do a lot of networking, so they feel very comfortable with each other. They started talking, they know each other. So he immediately had friends from the first day of class. We learned everyone's names. And so he teamed up with some other students and learned how to use a cell phone. And they were happy to teach him. They were excited. They were showing him all the different things you could do with a cell phone, taught him how to text message. Within a few weeks, he went out and decided it was time for him to get a cell phone. And his kids were cheering because they couldn't get a hold of him. He just had the home line. And he, they wanted to talk to their dad. So he came, came with us and, and purchased a cell phone. I'm not saying every student will do that. But for him, it was very exciting because no one had ever taught him how. He didn't see the benefit until the other students shared it with him. So if students don't have a mobile device, first of all, goose chase is not required. It's just for fun. Second of all, let's get into groups. Let's get into teams. I hand out playing cards, which you can also do online. Hearts over here, spades over there, diamonds over here. All right, get with the diamonds. Establish one text messenger or one polling person or someone who's the fastest text messenger or someone who wants to learn how to text message, and they're going to be your key person. And then we switch the next time we get together or for the next unit. So you can engage students by encouraging them to work together, and that's how I handle that. And truthfully, it's been a positive result in my experience. Cody, go ahead. Oh, absolutely. So we want to talk next about FaceTime. Now I see a lot of you have iPads in the audience, lots of you have iPhones. FaceTime is basically, and it's just boiled down the whole video problem. We talked about how students like to see your faces, how they feel more engaged, more connected to you as an instructor, and they know you personally. And if you believe that engagement starts with personal relationships with your students, this is the way that you can do that. So I wanted to show you, oh, this is not it. I'm going to show you quickly how Athena and I can FaceTime. She has an iPhone, I have an iPad here. This works between iPods, iPhones, and iPod, iPads. Also works on Mac OS 10.7 or look, the newest Mac the Lion, Lion, <coughs> the newest version of Mac OS. They're, they're, they're changing so often. Um, yeah. So I'm, I have Athena has information up here. I'm just going to click on her, and it's going to call. Very, very just sort of here. Her phone start ringing, maybe. There you go. And in just a moment, it'll connect, and we'll see a deepest face, and a theme will actually see you guys. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so there's a theme. So you can use this for office hours, for talking with students. I can imagine this being useful for student observations, setting up in the back of the room, watching them interact with other students. So lots of really tremendous possibilities. And one of the great things about 
mean the work doing the library for a job is that you show some technologies to the instructors or yourself. And you guys know how this can best be used. So I'm excited because FaceTime is getting more and more popular. And with the most recent announcement of iOS 6, the latest operating system for Mac mobile devices, you'll be able to do this on 3G instead of just cellular or just Wi Fi as it was before. So that means that wherever you have cellular connection, you can video call. That's really exciting. I think that we're going to see some great uses coming from this. So the cool thing, I was in Canada recently for an AERA, Educational Research Association, conference. And I didn't want to pay international phone rates. Got on wireless, husband got on wireless, and we FaceTimed the whole time I was in Canada. Instead of phone calling each other each night to say how our day went, FaceTime was free. So it really was a benefit to us in that sense. Yeah. And some of you are probably thinking, I don't have an Mac device, I don't have an iPhone. Use Skype. Skype works the same way. There are lots of tools out there that you can use to replicate this kind of functionality. I think this is powerful because iOS devices have become so ubiquitous. People have it. If they're on a PC, they might have an iPad, they might have an iPhone. And if they don't have an iPad or an iPhone, if they have a Mac computer, they can use that for FaceTime as well. Students um, that I advise through the statewide elementary education program often feel very uh, out there. They're disconnected. They're in rural areas. They, they need connection to UW. They need to feel me, talk to me, see me. So we can either set up a video conference and schedule a room and schedule a time, or I can say, just give me a call. If you have iOS, let's FaceTime. They get to FaceTime with their advisor, and so they feel a little bit more connected that way. Okay, so just briefly, we've been using Poll Everywhere. You've all seen a synopsis of it, and we're going to have a session on it this afternoon, so I'm not going to touch a lot, but another way to engage students. And I'm telling you, they love it. And I'll talk more about it this afternoon. Kennedy Pen Tool is going to be with me. Um, but use this. You can do quick quizzes. You can start a discussion. Hey, what are your thoughts on this? And then it opens all kinds of answers and responses from students that you can then choose to discuss. You can accept feedback from students in an online class or a face-to-face -face class. So I have students pull, I pull out there and say, How about, how's class going for you? Tell me something I need to improve and something you like. And they pull it in. Everybody gets to see it in front of the class. I take constructive criticism very well and make changes to the class based on what students say. Also, you can engage a variety of learners. My quiet, quiet people, maybe in the back of the room, maybe even in the front of the room, Guess what? They're not, a lot of times, not afraid to pull in. They like to think about what they're going to say and type it in, rather than raise their hand, stand up, and speak. So not everyone in class is, is outgoing in that way, and they'd rather respond via the poll. So I engage almost all of my students, either allowing them to respond verbally, or they can respond via the poll. And again, 99% of students are using these, these cell phones. Just a couple quick things to add on to that. The University of Wyoming, they because of Christy and Athena's efforts has a side license, so if you want to use Poll Everywhere, it's free to you. The University of Wyoming has paid for that for all of campus. The second thing is, just from a student perspective, the alternative to using a cell phone and using Poll Everywhere is to buy a clicker. So you go to the bookstore, you buy a $20 clicker, and then you take that home, and then you pay $15 to so register it. You need to remember to bring that clicker with you to class. And I have an iPad and an iPhone and my laptop. My bag is full of stuff, so the chances that I'm going to forget that clicker in a wrong bag or in my car, or I can get to class and the battery's going to be dead because I didn't turn it off last time, or I didn't register it properly with this particular class. The experience of using the clicker from the student side is just horrendous, and it's more expensive. Whereas my cell phone, I'm already paying for the plan for this, I have texting, and many of us have unlimited technology plan because that's what the cell phone devices push us to. And if we don't, it's 10 cents a text. So if we take that $20 for the clicker and $15 per semester to use that clicker to register for your class, it's $35. Or the very worst case scenario for a cell phone, I can spend 10 cents per text message. So from the student side, it's a device I'm already carrying. It's something I've already bought and paid for, and it's cheaper than the clickers. And actually, with the clicker, there's only uh, one way to respond, A, B, C, D, E, whatever it is. With Poll Everywhere, they can have open-ended responses as well. Now, we're going to talk more about that later, so I'm not trying to put you off. But Poll Everywhere is coming this afternoon, so don't worry. Can we can we wait till this afternoon, or do you have a comment? Question? It's about FaceTime. Oh, FaceTime. Oh. Go ahead, yeah. Can, I'm oh, sorry. Facebook. Facebook. Okay. Can you set your page up in a way that they don't see all personal stuff and people who've commented? 
Uh, from your personal profile, you mean? Like your friends and family? You know, my regular Facebook page has so much stuff on it that's right. personal. Right. No, this is a separate page from your profile. So it is a class page where they only see class information. They don't even see your name. They see the name of the class, and they obviously know the instructor is responding. But they don't see any of your friends, any of your family. Your, your own profile is totally disconnected from the page, except that you're the manager. That's a great question. Tammy, do you have a comment? Uh, just to speak to that same point, I actually have two Facebooks. Um, my personal fa uh, Facebook is set to ultimate private, whereas I have a public one that students find me on, and they think it's cool to friend their professors. and. Because I don't have a lot of personal content on there, I don't have a problem with friending them on that one. So that might be something you want to think about. Thanks, Tammy. OK. We'll move on to drum roll. What's next? We're, all, we're getting there. We're almost done. This is Public the last one. Engagement. I know it's a lot. <laughs> so we, just before you start, Athena, someone texted in the way they want to engage or could engage their students it's by avoiding, avoiding large walls of text. This is one way to do that. Vokies are fun. Type in Vokey.com. Some of you have heard of them. It's engaging avatar audio. So we had fun playing with avatars in Second Life last night. Multiple hairstyles and purses and all of that. Well, here you go. Here we are at Vokey. There's, there's Athena Kennedy in the snow skiing with her cool sunglasses on. And I can engage students this way. And sometimes, just in class, they'll say, oh, here, let's listen to a Vokey to change it up, to keep attention. But also, you could post these online as different ways. You can see I have a person. Here's Zulu. He's kind of a weird guy. And then uh, he's just got you know funky hair. And then here's a dog. So you can have animals, different things. So we'll click on that Vokey there play, Cody. And she'll tell us a little something. Athena Kennedy, I hope you're enjoying the instruction presentation so far. This engaging presume will stimulate your thoughts and provide additional information about classroom, community, and student engagement in online classes. Enjoy the information and please let me know if you have questions. Thank you for your participation. That's just a little example, Vokey. But you can um, create Vokies. It says create new Vokey. They're really easy to do. You add text. You change your persona and your avatar. You add different voices. That's my favorite part. So you can have all different voices for your Vokies. Just a way to keep students engaged. Okay. Write that one down. We'll help you with it later. Go ahead. Is there a time limitation for that? Yeah, I think that they don't go over five minutes. But you can always do two or three. Christy? Oh, one minute. Okay. Can you use your own voice? So you can use that like as a Yeah, you can record your own voice too. And in this case, she's just fed it some text. And it's, uh, it's just reading my text, essentially. So there's been a lot of talk this uh, technology camp about podcasting, video cam, video podcasting, or netcasting as well. And we want to start by showing you a video compiled of the great tip of Rachel's podcast. Rachel teaches microbiology, a really tough and complex class. But she uses podcasting to take some of her in-class materials and then explain in more depth um, in person, so to speak. Here. Yeah, so it's all about making and breaking the dietary system. Because you can have this could become oxidized, and they form something called a disulfide bond, or a cysteine. So we have a picture down here at the bottom where you can see this happening. So we're just looking then, um, here is the essential carbon atom, um, and then you can see uh, we've got the R group, and this is the amino group, and up here the carboxyl group. Begin then by looking at the most hydrophobic of the aromatic R groups, um, which is termed phenylalanine. And in phenylalanine, as you might expect, um, there is a benzene ring um, attached through a beta carbon. So it is extremely water hating um, because of all of the hydrocarbons in this benzene 
ring and, um, of course, the beta carbon as well. Quick feedback 
um, how your students are doing. This is just another way to do that. There's a great TED Ed video. We won't play you now for the sake of time. But if you're interested in knowing more about that, TED has this great three minute video that shows you exactly how it works, how you can use it, and what the benefits are for you and your students. And the video is embedded here in this presentation, which we will make available to you. So if you just want to go through the presentation again, because it was a lot to digest in however much time we've had, fact, then you can access it. It's up right now on the Technology Bootcamp Resources page. So for Dean and Cody, there's a link to our pressing. So all of this on our tree of engagement leads to technology empowers engagement. It's not technology for technology's sake. It's using technology to engage students where they already are. It's bringing your academic content to where your students are hanging out right now. And we, we don't mean to overwhelm anyone with this, this information. I'm sure we have. But what to do is choose one or two things that you're really interested in and focus on those and implementing those maybe for the next semester. And just play with those, see how they go. And then maybe the next semester, choose another thing. So this is not something you have to say, oh, I'm going to do TED Ed, Bokies, I'm going to add a wiki, I'm going to go to a Facebook page, and I'm going to just throw all the students for a girl. No. The thing is, pick one or two that might work for you and employ them in the classroom. Here's our references, which you can also find in the bibliography. And finally, we have finished. Thank you all for your contributions. <laughs>